After losing my family when I was younger, all I had left was myself. But despite my tragic past, I was still a high and proud woman of the Oni race. I now lived in a village full of demi-humans who had been rejected by society, yet for some reason, they accepted me. As time went on, I started making friends with them. I established a daily routine and eventually became satisfied with my ordinary, peaceful life. Finally, I was comfortable once again, and for that, I was glad. It was when I had thoughts like these that they all disappeared in a scene of flames. Welcome back, everyone, to part four of the Rem If prequel. This is the final part of the series, and we will be covering the last three chapters, starting with the interlude, then chapter six, and finally the epilogue. Last video, we learned that the Dark Tia is actually an Oni woman borrowing her appearance and her powers. This interlude is actually the Oni woman's backstory, and because she hasn't been named yet, I think I'm going to read it from her perspective to make it easier to understand. Before I begin though, I have to warn you, there is a brief appearance of a character that will also appear in Arc 5, also known as Season 3. I will be using this character's official artwork, and I'm going to include all the details that this chapter provided. That being said, I still think anime onlys can watch this without any problems, because the spoilers are so minuscule that you probably wouldn't have even known you got spoiled if I didn't tell you. We don't even get the character's name. If you still want to skip them though, check the description for timestamps. But without further ado, let's begin right where we left off. The young man who taught me to grow crops, the elderly neighbors who showed me kindness, all of them burned. I was the only one who survived. The hooded figures overpowered me and laughed as my body slowly burned in the fire. As I lied there helplessly, I heard another woman's insane voice approaching me slowly. The voice was both psychotic and wicked, and it echoed inside my head, tormenting me. As if I wasn't already suffering enough, the crazy woman walked up to me and poured something disgusting into my body. It creeped in through my ears and slithered around inside me, violating my body. The whole time, the crazy woman taunted me while the other witch cultists laughed. I shrieked in agony as not just my body but my soul rejected the repulsive liquid flowing through my insides. Work's all done, the crazy woman said as she walked away. But even after she left, her voice kept echoing inside my head. Suddenly, my nose could detect the witch's scent for the first time. I could smell the people that tortured me and burned my village. The disgusting thing she poured into my body somehow advanced my sense of smell. And from that moment on, I vowed to punish anyone who smelled like the witch. Using my party members' dead bodies as shields, I was able to get past the deadly wind surrounding Zarestia's bed. After retrieving the light ball, I finally had enough power to slaughter everyone with the witch's scent. One particular night, my nose reacted strongly to a young man walking the streets of a town called Banan. He was on his way home after a hard day's work at one of the town's mansions, and there was someone with him too, a cute woman with blue hair. She was another Oni, the same race as me, the same blood as me. I didn't understand. How could another member of the Oni race be happily in love with someone like him, someone that smelled like the witch? Is she really going to protect a witch cultist? In that case, I'll just have to kill her too. The woman dressed in white collapsed after I threw her against the wall. Her scream sounded familiar. Her voice is the same one I hear endlessly telling me to kill. I lifted her up and drained her of her power. I watched as her existence slowly turned into dust. With her last breath, it sounded like she was trying to say someone's name. However, it didn't matter to me. The woman crumbled into dust and her remains were scattered by the blowing wind. Finally, my power was complete. 
All that's left now is to get my revenge, not only on the enemy with the scent of the witch, but also that woman who's close with him. Killing both of them is the only thing that will comfort me. This will be my atonement. It isn't hatred, it's my duty. Rem was laying in bed at the clinic with Subaru at her side. The child would be born any second now, but Rem second guesses herself. She reflects on her past and admits that she was a bad child and a bad sister, so maybe she'll be a bad parent as well. Subaru tries his best to comfort her, but she asks him again if he regrets all of this. Subaru was quiet for a bit, but after a moment he rubbed his eyes and then spoke up. No, Rem, that's not it. I... I've been saved. My entire life I've been running. I ran away from my parents. I ran away from reality. I even ran away from the promise I made. I threw away everything and ran away with you. But even after all that running, when I heard that we had a child, I was happy. And that's what saved me. Rem was speechless after Subaru finished talking. Her red face got even redder and with tears in her eyes, she gave Subaru a slight smile and told him, but then Subaru is kicked out of the room by the doctor cause Rem's about to give birth and Subaru would just get in the way. Outside of the clinic though, Halibal was waiting for Subaru. We've got business to take care of, Halibal says. Reaching into his kimono, he reveals a bracelet identical to the one he gave Tia. Apparently, these bracelets have magical power as long as there's two of them. But Halibal's bracelet lost its magical power, meaning that something bad happened to Tia. When Halibal and Subaru realize this, the two of them agree to avenge Tia and stop this Oni woman once and for all. The slaughterous wind turned everything to dust. Halibal's throwing knives were repelled by the wind attacks. No matter how many he threw, he couldn't hit the Black Tia. The Black Tia was busy dealing with Halibal, but she couldn't ignore the stench in the air. The witch's scent was getting stronger and it disgusted her, to the point that she couldn't take it anymore. She ignored Halibal and went straight for Subaru. You know, your face is a lot cuter when you smile, almost as cute as my wife's, Subaru says. The dark Tia replies with die and then shoots at him with wind magic which is blocked by a knife thrown by Halibal. She chases them across rooftops, blasting wind magic at them. All the while, the voice in her head continues telling her to kill. But she senses that they might be leading her to a trap, so she was hesitant to leave the rooftop. However, something happened that made her lose all sense of reason. The witch's scent intensified and the dark Tia lost control. She jumps down and shoots a blast of wind at Subaru, and Halibal launches him into the sky but wasn't able to avoid the attack himself. He apologizes to Subaru and then dies. The dark Tia felt joy after confirming the kill and looked up at Subaru, her next target. The voice inside her head told her to tear his body limb from limb and then bring his remains to his wife to teach her a lesson. But while Subaru's flying through the air, he shouts, Do it now! And then suddenly something was thrown at the Black Tia from every direction. It was a bunch of wet pieces of cloth slowly flying towards her. She still had plenty of time to kill Subaru though, and without Halibal, Subaru had no way of dodging the attack. But the voice inside the Dark Tia's head telling her to kill suddenly changed. I don't want Rem to hate me it said, and then the Black Tia froze. She couldn't move her hands or legs, she couldn't kill, and she couldn't dodge the wet pieces of cloth. They hit her and wrapped around her body over and over. She screamed as if her skull was breaking as the sharp scent of alcohol entered her nose. Her body lost its form and started coming off as if it was ice melting. She lost all her power as well and was now nothing more than a regular Oni. I'm sorry, Halibal says, and sticks a knife through the center of her chest. It was over. Remember, Halibal is trained in the art of curses, and to apply a curse, you have to touch someone. Well, Halibal infused some of his fur and nails into his weapons so that they can apply curses as well. 
This means that in chapter 2, when Halibal threw a knife into the woman's back, he applied a curse to her. Three of the Halibals throw knives at her and she manages to block two of them, but the third pierces through her thin back. So this whole time, she's actually been a lot weaker than she would have been if Halibal didn't curse her during their first encounter. This really says a lot about how smart and powerful Halibal really is, and also how powerful the great spirits are as well. Being able to operate this efficiently under the effects of a curse definitely implies tremendous power. Anyway, Subaru apologizes to the dying Oni woman. He tells her that he's not a witch cultist, he's a father, and that's why he had to kill her. Protecting his pregnant wife was his only concern. I hate her, the Oni woman says. She was talking about Rem. Her eyes weren't looking at Subaru or anywhere in this world. They were looking at something that doesn't exist. It was the happiness she was supposed to have, the life that was stolen from her. All she had now was hatred and jealousy towards Rem. No, it was envy. What's your name? Subaru says. The girl tried to talk but couldn't get the word out, but from what Subaru could hear, her name was Reese. As the light left her eyes, Subaru vowed to never forget her name, but her envy was something Subaru would never speak of again for the rest of his life. Subaru thanks Halibal for going along with his plan. The whole town had helped out, actually. Tia was very popular, so the town was more than happy to help avenge her. The plan ended up being a success, as there were no victims other than the Oni woman, but that was unavoidable. Suddenly, a wind comes down across the garden, carrying a white figure to the ground. Yes, Tia was back. Many hundreds of years ago, long before there were witches and dragons, the great spirit Serestia roamed the continent freely, using her magic as she pleased. With her hands, she produced fire. With her legs, she dug up the earth. With her tail, she created water. And with her mouth, she controlled wind. The great spirit had a friendly relationship with the people of the world. She would do favors for them, and they would offer her gifts in return. However, there was a time when the people asked her for fire, just fire. But Zarestia wanted to use wind magic as well, as wind magic was her symbol of freedom. So she gave the people both fire and wind, and the combination of the two resulted in the country burning to the ground. Zarestia didn't understand why what she did was wrong, so the people turned against her. They invited her to a celebration and gave her alcohol to drink. She didn't understand what alcohol was, so she drank everything they gave her. And eventually she passed out, and that's when the angry citizens got their revenge. When Zarestia woke up, she was missing all her limbs. Her arms, legs, and tail were gone, and with them, her ability to use fire, water, and earth magic disappeared as well. My body, where is it? Give it back, she said. But the people wouldn't listen. Instead, they showered her with alcohol and set it on fire. But Zarestia still had her head, her mouth, her fangs, and her wind. Not a single person survived. Zarestia killed everyone she saw, even those who were innocent. When Zarestia was happy, she wanted to kill. When she was sad, she wanted to kill. When she went to sleep, she wanted to kill. And when she woke up, she wanted to kill. It was the only way for her to feel free again. So she killed and killed and wouldn't stop. The same people that formerly called her beautiful now called her a Shinigami. I am Zarestia, the most beautiful Shinigami. And Zarestia was free. Rem was in terrible agony. Giving birth was so painful that she couldn't even feel the horn coming out of her head. She focused all her energy into the baby, closed her eyes, and tried her best to push through the pain. But when she opened her eyes, she saw something unexpected. It was no hallucination. Tia truly was standing there, smiling with a murderous look in her eyes. It was a genuine smile, but it was completely full of bloodlust. 
She was wearing the white outfit, so it was definitely the good Tia. However, the aura she gave off was exactly the same as the bad Tia, which meant, You got your light ball back, Rem says. Tia gets embarrassed and starts nervously playing with her hair, and with a red face, Tia timidly confirms Rem's suspicion. Rem wasn't afraid, but she had to ask, Tia, are you going to kill me? After a moment of suspenseful silence, Tia answers her, I want to, but I love you guys, so I won't kill you. Subaru still wasn't allowed inside the clinic, so he sat outside with Halible, praying that everything goes alright. He prayed to every deity he could remember, and even added Tia's name right at the end of the list. Halible asks him if he's decided on a name for the child yet, which of course he had. Subaru says that if it's a girl, he wants to name her Spica, and if it's a boy... Before he could finish, the clinic door opened and Rem walked outside. In her arms, she was holding her newborn son. Rigel, it's time to go to school, said Rem to the six-year-old boy with light blue hair. Rigel was a sassy, energetic kid, just like his father. Except Rigel was also different from his father in a lot of ways. For one, he was able to produce a single horn from his forehead, which would gather mana and fill his body with strength, making him feel like he could do anything. But he avoided showing his horn around his mom because he knew she felt guilty that he was only born with one. Rem was actually pregnant again, and Rigel made it clear that he wanted the baby to be his little sister. For some reason, Rigel is a major, major siscon. But anyway, on the way to school, Rigel runs into his uncle Halible, who's been secretly training him in the arts of this shinobi. Obviously, Rem and Subaru have no idea that Halible's been doing this. The two of them chat for a while, and after Halible leaves, Rigel runs into a beautiful woman dressed in white. To his surprise, the woman addresses him by name and explains that she knows his parents. She offers him a bracelet as a gift, but Rigel turns it down. After all, Rem always told him not to accept things from strangers, so Rigel rejects the gift and then Tia starts crying and threatens to kill him. Rigel wasn't afraid of her though, because somehow he could tell that she wasn't really going to hurt him. The woman introduces herself as Tia and explains that she's basically part of his family so he can trust her. The two of them start walking together and Tia hums a song along the way. The same song from before, in fact it might be the only song Tia knows. But surprisingly, Rigel recognized the song. It was the same tune his mom would hum sometimes, and if he remembered correctly, she had always called it the Tia song. Well, I guess I'll just have to accept her as family then, Rigel thought to himself. Under that light blue sky, in that ordinary looking town, in that corner of the world, irreplaceable happiness existed for the Natsuki family. To achieve this, there also existed things that were sacrificed, people that were lost, places that were abandoned, and memories that can't be forgotten. But despite everything they left behind, Natsuki Subaru and Natsuki Rem will continue to live in this world as it goes on. And that was one ending for the lost boy who wandered into another world. And that concludes the Rem If prequel. Yes, this was just the prequel, so the story does continue with the original Rem If, but after this point, all the conflict is resolved, and what's left is basically just slice of life type filler stuff. So right here is where the Sloth If story really ends, and the content after this point could be viewed as a sort of OVA for lack of better terminology. What makes this If story different from the others is that Subaru overcame his mental conflict by the end of the story. In the beginning, Subaru chose the path of Sloth, but once he realized that he was a father, he chose Diligence instead and finally went through the same development that he was supposed to get from episode 18. 
The difference was, in the main story, it only took him that one conversation with Rem to obtain it, but in the Sloth If story, it took him much longer. It's not like he didn't choose the right path in the end, he was just too slow. I thought that was a very clever way of thematically incorporating Sloth into the story while at the same time still giving Subaru a happy ending with Rem. This if story gave us a lot of new information, a massive amount of world building, and some awesome new characters that could potentially appear later on in the main story. But in my opinion, the most important thing from this if story are the possible theories that it allows us to form. I don't know how many of you picked up on this, but I want to talk about a huge detail from this story that might affect the main story in a future arc. For some reason, the witch cult was trying to exterminate the Oni race, and that crazy woman was conducting some very evil experiments with a mysterious liquid. But the Oni woman Reese wasn't able to smell the witch's scent until after that liquid settled inside her body. Reese being able to smell the witch's scent was a symptom of that crazy woman's experiment. This is very important because it means we can assume that normal Oni aren't supposed to be able to smell the witch's scent. But remember, Rem can. Rom can't, the other Oni can't, and Reese couldn't either, until the crazy woman poured that liquid into her body. So the theory is, something similar happened to Rem when her village was attacked, and that's why she's able to smell the witch's scent. This if story also pretty much confirmed that the founder of Kararagi was originally from Japan. I mean, literally everything in Kararagi mimics early Japanese culture, so that's another very interesting detail that'll probably have some relevance in the future. But anyway, I really enjoyed this if story, and I had a blast making these videos as well, so thank you guys for all the amazing support you've been giving this series. I also want to give a special thanks to Dominic for the amazing Reese artwork. I think this might be the first fan art in existence for this character, so seriously, thank you so much, man. If you guys want to see more of Dominic's artwork, you can click the link in the description, and I highly recommend you check him out. He's very, very talented. But also, let me know what you guys thought about the Sloth If story. How does it hold up against the others? I think this one might be my second or a third favorite now. I'm not sure, but it was definitely better than I thought it was the very first time I read it. By the way, keep in mind that these videos are just summaries, and I have to handpick which details to include and which ones to cut, so the only way to get the full experience of these if stories is to actually read them yourself. That being said, if you enjoyed the video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to be notified whenever I upload another If Story video. But that's all I got for you guys today. Keep talking about ReZero. I'm out for now. Peace out.